This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good afternoon. I am uh, Andrew Seri, Dean of Graduate Division, and I'm pleased, along with the Moses Lecture Committee, to present Carolyn Merchant, this year's speaker in the Bernard Moses Memorial Lecture Series. As a condition of this bequest, we're obligated to tell you how the endowment supported the lectures, supporting the lectures came to UC Berkeley. In 1937, University of California President Robert Gordon Sproul and the UC Board of Regents established the Bernard Moses Memorial Lectureship in the Social Sciences. The lectureship honors the memory of the late Bernard Moses, a professor of history and of political science at the University of California from 1875 to 1911, and an emeritus professor from 1911 until his death in 1930. Professor Moses earned a worldwide reputation for his contributions in understanding the problems of Latin American republics and as a pioneer scholar. Professor Moses served as a member of the United States Philippine Commission from 1900 to 1904. Past lecturers in this series have included Herma Hill Kay, Lloyd Ullman, Nicholas Rasinovsky, George Lakoff, Kenneth Stamp, Eugene Hamill, and Ken Jowett. And now I'd like to invite Margaret Chowning, Professor of History and Chair of the Moses Memorial Lecture Committee, to introduce today's lecturer, Carolyn Merchant. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn, I don't want to touch your, <laughs> your computer here, so. Um, uh, Professor Carolyn Merchant is a renowned historian of many things, of science, of the environment, of scientific culture, of economic change, and of women. Her path-breaking book, The Death of Nature, Will Women, Ecology, and the Scientific Revolution, which was published in 1980, led to her being called an eco-feminist philosopher, which is a label I think is quite astounding for a historian to earn, <laughs> because of the book's rich and complex argument about the ways that the modern exploitation of nature subordinated women. In addition to The Death of Nature, Carolyn Merchant has authored numerous books, including Ecological Revolutions, Nature, Gender, and Science in New England in 1989, Radical Ecology, The Search for a Livable World in 1992, Earth Care, Women and the Environment in 1996, The Columbia Guide to American Environmental History, and Reinventing Eden, The Fate of Nature in Western Culture in 2003, as when, well as many articles uh, on the history of science, environmental history, the women and the environment. Carolyn Merchant received her BA from Vassar College and her PhD in the history of science from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She is a professor of environmental history, philosophy, and ethics here at Berkeley, where she has been a member of the faculty for the past three decades. Uh, Merchant's lecture today will focus on humanity's shift from the ethic of control of nature to one of partnership with the natural world. Since the scientific revolution of the 17th century, the long-term goal for the betterment of humankind was to understand science and manage nature. But in the 21st century, this has given way to environmental awareness and the formation of a viable, sustainable relationship in which connections to the global world are recognized through science, technology, and ecological exchanges. On that optimistic note, let me introduce Carolyn Merchant. Thank you. 
thank you very much for those wonderful introductions and for inviting me to give this uh, lecture. I'm just delighted to be here and to see all of you. And today, what I want to talk about is the um, transformation from the period prior to the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century, when basically people had to play the hand that nature dealt and did not have very much or very low level capacity for the control and management of nature. During the scientific revolution of the uh, 17th century, and by that I mean the period basically from Copernicus in the mid 16th century to Newton at the end of the uh, 17th century, a transformation came about in which the possibilities for uh, the contained controlled experiment and uh, therefore the control of nature and the management of the environment became possible. That uh, philosophy of nature um, has remained with us and is still with us uh, to the present day, but I want to outline what I think are new possibilities for a new ethic for the future, and that is what I call a partnership ethic. So we can talk about an era before environmentalism, and that would be the period um, at the end of the uh, medieval uh, era and the beginnings of the explorations of the new world, the rise of nation states, and particular the uh, emphasis that now became uh, possible on mining the earth for metals, especially for iron um, and for coal, and for other metals that would make the nation states of Europe strong and have power and be able to vie with each other. So the process of mining and also um, of um, the extension of uh, trade such as the wool trade meant that European uh, forests all over uh, the continent, and especially in England, were being depleted of trees, uh, forests were being cut down, marshes were drained, and much of the land was being converted to pasture. And so as this very early phase of industrialization uh, began to spread and, and began to increase, we had um, a change from the worldview of nature as a living organism and an economy based on human labor, animal labor, wind, and water. Um, in other words, organic forces of nature to one that was based on the metals and on coal and non-renewable um, inorganic energy sources. During the process of this immense transformation in Europe, the um, capability through science and technology to dominate and control the environment became more and more uh, feasible. And it's during this period when we have the um, two-sided um, development of science and technology, that is the rise of experimentation and the rise of a mathematical understanding of the world, the ability to um, derive mathematical laws that described um, first the heavens and then the terrestrial lands, and then as we move for forward, um, eventually to um, hydrodynamics and electricity and magnetism, 19th and uh, century thermodynamics, etc. So it is the experimental method and the mathematical method that together begin to give people the sense that they have the uh, technology and the understanding of the natural world. 
They are able through experimentation to define a closed controlled space and through mathematics a closed system and therefore to describe and understand the natural world which then gave them uh, the capacity for domination uh, and control. So the Renaissance um, philosophy of nature was one of a living organism. It was a projection of the human body onto the um, cosmos. The cosmos, like the human being, had a body, soul, and spirit. The earth also was alive, the, and the earth was conceptualized as a, nurse, nur, a nurturing mother. Um, which had uh, s uh, systems like the human being, a circulation, reproduction, and even elimination systems. Earthquakes uh, were said to be the earth-breaking wind. Um, <laughs> and the metals uh, grew in the earth's womb. And once a uh, mine was... Uh, uh, dug and the metals dug out of it, it was thought that the metals were alive and would grow back. So nature was the servant of God, the deity, carrying out God's will in the world below. And so uh, in this picture we see here, uh, by Athanasius Kircher in his book uh, Mundus Subterraneus, um, we see the interior of the earth and as uh, an earth that looks alive, as if it has wounds and um, veins and uh, circulatory devices and, and elimination as well. And uh, Kircher went to, um, uh, wrote this book in conjunction with a trip up Mount Vesuvius. Um, Pliny the Elder had been killed in the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 CE, and Kircher wanted to um, understand the interior of the Earth Mother, and so he took a journey down into the interior of Mount Vesuvius. I was in Naples about three years ago, and I decided I'd like to follow in the footsteps of Kircher, and so I commissioned my friends to take me up uh, Mount Vesuvius, and we got as far as the road that continued up to the top, but it was closed. So unfortunately, I uh, had to be satisfied with just seeing the uh, outside. The other primary view of nature in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries was the opposite of nature as a nurturer or as a mother, but rather as nature as the bringer of famine, of disease, of uh, hurricanes, of drought, and therefore uh, a more negative side of, um, of the aspect of nature as female. And nature also was thought to, in the interior of the earth, in, in the interior of nature, to harbor secrets. And it's the extraction of those secrets which were the goal of the 17th uh, century scientists. Uh, in some ways, this was nature being put to the question. A question would be asked of nature, and then one would pry into the inner workings of a, an organism or of, of the earth itself to try to answer that question. And it is uh, the vision of Francis Bacon to whom we owe um, the idea that it would be possible to extract the secrets of nature through science and technology, through the arts. Um, humans, Bacon said, should endeavor to establish and extend the power and, do and dominion of the human race itself over the universe. So this is a major goal of vision um, which we owe to Francis Bacon and which inspired his followers throughout the 17th century and um, for several centuries beyond. 
So Bacon's um, idea was one of experimentation. How was one, through experiment, going to reveal the secrets of nature to everybody for the good of humankind? Up until this time, uh, mu much of this work was done by alchemists and natural magicians and astrologers and those who believed that they had their own idea of, uh, of how to extract the secrets. Bacon wanted to make this public knowledge. And in uh, 1620, he wrote um, the Novum Organum, or the New Organon, which was a revision of Aristotle's work. He called it, or it translates as the new instrument. And basically, it means that the human being, through hands and eyes um, and mind, can act as an instrument on nature. Bacon's idea was that it was important to recover the lost Garden of Eden. And he said, man by the fall fell from his dominion over creation. But he argued that through science and technology, that is what he called the arts and science, it was possible to repair um, that loss and to, therefore to retain um, and regain the uh, original garden. He said, man can recover that right over nature which belongs to it by divine bequest. So the goal of extracting the secrets of nature through technology meant that because the earth was conceptualized as a female or a mother, that uh, he used um, language uh, such as the, the idea that the secrets are still locked in nature's bosom, and that the miners and smiths were searching into the bowels of nature, again, organic imagery, and shaping nature as on the anvil. So the idea of the experiment comes um, through Bacon, and it's developed in uh, ever greater sophistication as we move through the 17th century. But what I want to uh, talk about is Bacon's nascent idea of experimentation. He used the word experiment, and what he meant by it was that we should ask a question of nature. Um, now, he did not have the full idea of a contained, controlled experiment, or what he would have called nature in bonds. He said there were three states of nature. Nature is free and at liberty to develop all the animals and plants that we find on the earth today. Nature in error, uh, meaning nature uh, who had gone astray and somehow created monstrosities that shouldn't have been there. And then nature in bonds. Nature in bonds, um, he argued, was the um, control of nature at, uh, and the process of using technology to extract nature's secrets. So if we think about the rise of the experimental um, method, uh, what is Bacon is suggesting is that we have a questioner or a scientist, we would later call them, um, or an inquisitor who uh, sets up the question and um, dictates the conditions for the procedure. The objects then should be manipulated in order to extract an answer. And most importantly, you need witnesses or observers in order to um, compare uh, the observations uh, of each of them. Data need to be recorded and then it needs to be repeated in other uh, places and times. Now, Bacon wasn't there yet. He did not put this procedure in the way I have just done it, but he was, through vivid me metaphor and language, he was moving in that direction. 
So I want to talk about three settings out of which his concept of experiment emerges and therefore the idea of the possibility of controlling and therefore having dominion over nature. So um, the first setting is the courtroom. Bacon uh, was a uh, attorney general and the Lord Keeper and ultimately uh, the Lord uh, Verulam and uh, Baker, Bacon rose up through the court system. Um, he was the clerk of the Star Chamber early on in his career where um, uh, criminals were uh, questioned under um, very tightly controlled uh, conditions. Um, so the courtroom becomes an example of this idea, this nascent idea of the contained controlled experiment. You have a room that is set in inside um, where only the people who are privileged are allowed to enter, like the privileged uh, scientist. Um, those who have passed the bar can move in front of the bar and be allowed to be the judge or the lawyers um, or the jury. And so in this case, we see nature on trial uh, in these two images. Um, and we could think of the court case as science uh, v. nature, um, where you have a scientist, an inquisitor, or a judge um, versus nature as the witness. The importance of the witness um, is clear here. Nature must testify, and nature must be able to recognize the questions that are asked of it or her. Um, so one has to devise a language and ask questions that nature is capable of asking. So this was an important consideration in the um, 17th century and a move away from what the alchemists and natural uh, magicians were doing. Nature must be able to repeat the same answers again and again, not just um, uh, one time and a different answer uh, the next time. A second setting which is similar to the courtroom, which is an enclosed space where only privileged people are allowed to be, is the anatomy theater. And an example of the anatomy theater um, that Bacon was well aware of was that of uh, Vesalius uh, in his um, uh, 1543, um, corpus uh, humani, de humani corpus fabrica, uh, or um, the um, picture here which shows a, a, a corpse being dissected on a table in front of a great crowd of people. The early anatomy theaters uh, sloped downward to the central table and the um, anatomist or the barber surgeon stood at the table and did the dissection in the view of all those witnesses around it and opened up the corpse to reveal the secrets of nature that were contained by the body. In this particular example of the anatomy theater of Vesalius, the female body is being dissected here. The womb is cut open, just as if this were the womb of the earth being mined by um, the uh, miners and smiths. And Vesalius, as the surgeon, is standing erect over the supine body of the female, um, or what Bacon would later term the corpse of nature. And he argued that we must have, we must build an anatomy of the world and we must attempt to dissect nature. So although Bacon did not um, talk specifically about the anatomy theater, he did use the language of the anatomy theater in his effort to portray a method for extracting secrets uh, from the natural world. A third setting 
is that of the um, alchemical laboratory. And uh, Bacon was very influenced by the magical and the alchemical traditions. Um, there were books in the 16th century on the secrets of nature, and Bacon wanted to take those ideas of the alchemists and make them public knowledge for the benefit of humankind. And so in this picture, you can see all the kinds of apparatus in this enclosed space, which we would now term a laboratory. Bacon did not use the word laboratory, although it was introduced by Ben Johnson in his play, The Alchemist, during the time that uh, Bacon was at, at the court of uh, James I in the uh, 1610. So experimentation um, in an enclosed space is exemplified by the alchemical laboratory. A question is asked by the scientist. The scientist devises ap an apparatus to answer the question, records the data, and that data uh, is verified by witnesses. So Bacon termed this nature in constraint. He said nature in constraint is molded and made new by art in the hand of man. This is his third state of nature, or nature in bonds. In the New Atlantis, which um, was Bacon's utopia, which was based on Plato's uh, description of Atlantis in his, dia uh, in his uh, monologue, actually, the Critias. And Bacon wrote the New Atlantis, um, and it was published uh, posthumously a year after his death in 1627. And in it, he describes a set of laboratories, or what we would now think of as a scientific institution, which he called Solomon's House. And in it, he describes uh, perspective houses, where one would use lenses to understand light, engine houses, furnaces, sound houses, mathematical houses. All these would be separate laboratories in uh, the New Atlantis. And he talks about gardens and mines and caves, uh, pools, streams and fountains, which can be studied by the um, apprentices who are working in the um, uh, laboratories. Dissections and surgeries are carried out, um, just as we saw in the uh, previous illustrations, experiments with medicines, and most importantly, creation of new animals and plants. Animals that would um, uh, bear young earlier in their um, uh, period of, uh, of uh, maturation, plants that would come to fruition earlier in the season, um, he could study um, weather, and uh, basically this is what we would now think of as a form of genetic engineering. And the goal of all this, Bacon said, was the end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes and secret motions of things and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. So this is the grand vision which Bacon prepares by the end of the first quarter of the 17th century and which is to inspire his followers. Um, the Academy del Cimento in Italy, the Royal Society in uh, England, the French Academy of Sciences in France, all were modeled on this vision of Bacon's um, New Atlantis and Bacon's vision of dominion. The idea of the contained controlled experiment toward which Bacon was tending but was not there yet is epitomized by, uh, by the 1660s by Robert Boyle. The air pump is shown here in these illustrations and science is pointing upward to the heavens um, with her fingers but downward to Robert Boyle with her elbow. And on uh, one side, we have the alchemical laboratory. This is the place from whence science has come. 
and on the other side, the bell jar, which is the uh, epitome of the scientific experiment uh, by the 1660s. Now, one could put a living animal or a plant or a bird inside the bell jar and evacuate the air and then study uh, what happened. So the bell jar is to us today, um, as the cyclotron was to the 20th century, or as the Large Hadron co uh, Collider is to the 21st century. Um, this was the epitome of uh, science. It was not without its critics, however, and the bell jar is shown here in an experiment by Joseph Wright of uh, Derby, in w which he uh, shows an experiment on a bird in the air pump. And uh, you can see here how the experimenter, the scientist, has taken the uh, bird, the cockatoo, uh, from the cage um, up here. And the cockatoo is now in the bell jar. And he holds in his hand the power of life and death. Uh, the ability to turn the stopcock and evacuate the air and kill uh, the bird in the bell jar. Now, if you look at the gendered uh, responses of the men and women here, the men are looking right at the experiment or contemplating, as the uh, older man down here, contemplating death by looking at a skull. Um, but the women are looking at the men e experiencing the experiment vicariously um, or hiding their eyes uh, from the experiment. So the men are witnessing the emergence of a scientific truth, but the women are experiencing a, um, a visceral reality. By the end of the 17th century, we have the experimental tradition coming into conjunction with the mathematical tradition. The mathematical tradition being revived um, by uh, philosophers such as Descartes uh, and Hobbes and by um, scientists uh, in, the, in the late 17th century, um, epitomized by Newton. Um, Newton's philosophy of the mechanical universe brought together the heavens and the work of Kepler and Copernicus and the terrestrial world with the work of Galileo and uh, put, pulled them together in a world that is a con contained, controlled space in which there are ideal spheres. The planets must be conceptualized as ideal spheres with their point of uh, gravitation at the center and of a frictionless world, uh, no air resistance, in order for the mathematical laws um, to hold. So the mechanistic view of nature is the result of the period between Copernicus and uh, Newton at the end of the century. The worldview changes from an organism to a machine. Nature now as a machine is made up of parts of hard glassy atoms um, or particles as Newton called them that can be rearranged from outside by a scientist or an engineer. The world becomes a clock-like universe as opposed to a nurturing mother. God uh, becomes an engineer and a mathematician. Mathematics becomes the source of valid knowledge or truth of the external world, and it is through mathematics that one is able to solve equations and therefore to predict, and if you can predict, therefore you can control and therefore dominate nature. 
So the control of nature through experimentation, which was Bacon's vision, and through mathematics leads to this idea of the domination of nature through controlled spaces and closed mathematical systems. Now this vision accompanies the spread of Europe and the rise of the nation states into the new world. And it's through the rise of science and technology that Bacon's vision of the recovery of Eden begins to be uh, played out. Eden can be reinvented or recreated on Earth. And as the new world is settled and uh, people move westward, First, the forests of the east, um, eastern states of the US are cut down and turned into farms and managed gardens. And then the western deserts are irrigated and turned also into gardens. So the biblical idea of not only um, recovering Eden, but of making the desert blossom as the rose occurs in the process of the settlement of the United States. Nature now can be thought of as a garden, very much like the controlled contained spaces that Bacon was uh, working toward. Nature as a garden surrounded by fences in which one um, puts fertilizers, whether it's manures or later chemical fertilizers, and uh, still later uh, pesticides. Now, what about the challenges to this mechanistic view of the control and management of nature, which we um, inherit from the 17th century? The first, uh, one of the first challenges is that of ecology. Um, the word uh, devised by Ernst Haeckel, it comes from the Greek, Greek word oikos, meaning household, the root of both the word ecology and economy. And he uh, wrote in 1866 about the science of the relations of living organisms to the external world. Now, this is not the contained controlled system. Um, this is now relationships of all organisms to each other and to their environment. In 1869, he um, wrote that the body of knowledge concerning the economy of nature is uh, what he means by the oikos, the study of the complex interrelations in the struggle for existence. He was influenced here by Darwin's work. And he used the word um, ecology, spelled O-E-K, at this point in um, 1873. Now, the person who introduced ecology from Heckel into the United States was a woman. And her name was Ellen Swallow Richards. Uh, Ellen Swallow attended Vassar College, and then she went on to MIT as a special student where she married a chemist uh, by the name of Richards. And in 1892, she gave a talk to the Boston Boot and Shoe Club in <laughs> which she um, christened a new science which she called ecology. And it was um, reported in the newspapers the next day, a new science, Mrs. Richards names it ecology. Uh, it, so she introduced the term into the United States. Um, we have to credit her with that, and also using the term human ecology, the concept of human ecology, uh, which she uh, developed in 1907 in her book, uh, The Sanitation in Daily Life. Here she is shown slightly before her death with an honorary doctorate, which she received from Smith College. Ecology introduced by men was a little later, and uh, one of those who um, used the word um, was Frederick Clements in 1905, and he developed this science of uh, plant succession. Some of his ideas have been cr uh, criticized in um, recent years, but he 
moved us back toward the idea of the organism, the living organism or the organismic character of the community and ecology. So during the early 20th century, we have the emergence of ecology, of ecological systems which are based on relationships and which are open systems rather than closed systems in which matter and energy are exchanged across uh, boundaries. Another challenge to mechanistic science was at the level of the um, very minute um, and the very large. Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity, followed um, later by his general theory, and especially his ideas um, about the uh, quantum structure of light, or is light made up of photons. So Einstein challenged uh, mechanistic science at the level of the very small and at the level of the speed of light. But on the, in the everyday world, a major challenge came through the development of the science of chaos, um, followed later by the idea of complexity science. Edward Lorentz, um, in 1972, uh, wrote a foundational paper entitled, Can the Flap of a Butterfly's Wings in Brazil Result in a Tornado in Texas? Um, known later as the butterfly effect. The idea being that the atmosphere is fundamentally irregular and unstable and that weather patterns are chaotic and unpredictable and the best you can do is the one day uh, prediction. Similarly, most environmental and biological systems are nonlinear systems and chaotic. Chaos is the usual situation. It is the very unusual situation that we can think of as the closed contained uh, world where we can uh, predict the outcomes. So all of this to me means that we need to rethink the uh, foundations of our ethical systems of our relationship to the natural world. We are part of the ecosystem, we are part of nature, and we are in a relationship with other uh, organisms and non-living things as well. How do we get then from the control of nature and the management of nature, which was so powerful by the end of the 19th century, and which was really the underlying ethic of um, the settlement of the new world, to the idea of a partnership ethic in terms of a different relationship uh, between humanity and nature? Where did it come from and how can it help us? I formulate the idea of the partnership ethic as the following, a combination of utilitarian ethics and ecological ethics. The greatest good for the human and non-human communities is in their mutual living interdependence. And I argue that in order to um, actuate a partnership ethic, we need to think about um, five additional precepts. First of all, that we have equity between the human and non-human communities. Uh, we are living in a urban community here in Berkeley, but we are dependent on an ecological community, a natural world, uh, in which we are in a vital relationship. Um, we need to give moral consideration, not only for humans, but for other organisms, for other species. We need to respect both cultural diversity and biodiversity. And we need to include women, minorities, and non-human nature in the code of ethical accountability. So in order to bring this out, we need a new kind of management not the domination and control of nature, but an ecologically sound management that is going to maintain the health of the human community and the non-human community. 
So why do we need it? Because we are in the midst of a global ecological crisis. We are experiencing climate change, um, ozone depletion, deforestation, soil erosion, loss of our forests, and the endangerment of uh, thousands of species um, on the planet. And because population is still growing, although its growth rate is tapering off, but we now are uh, close to 7 billion people. In another year or two, we will be at 7 billion. And perhaps by 2040, somewhere between 8 and 12 billion, depending on the rate of um, decline. Um, so, or. The origins of partnership ethics come about with the rise of conservation, with the conservation and then followed by the environmental movements. The forest reserves uh, created in the 19th century, uh, rangelands, and the conservation movement of the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. George Perkins Marsh in 1864 argued for what I think of as a partnership relationship. He said man should become a co-worker with nature in the reconstruction of the damaged fabric. He argued that we could restore the waters and forests and the bogs that were laid waste by human improvidence or malice. And then in the middle of the 20th century, um, we have the work of the ecologist, um, originally wildlife biologist, Aldo Leopold, and he uses the word partnership. He says, when land does well for its owner and the owner does well by his land, when both end up by better of reason of their partnership, then we have conservation. Women also have been instrumental in helping to formulate and move us toward the idea of partnership based on relations, based on relationship between men and women, between men and men, between women and women, and between humanity and the natural world. Val Plumwood, an Australian philosopher, wrote Feminism and the Mastery of Nature, and she said that relation must be the basis for a new ethic, an ethic of care. And the relational self is based in friendship and respect and care for the other. So my idea of the partnership ethic is grounded in the idea of relation, not in the ego, not in society, not in the land, as Leopold had said, but in the idea of relationship, of non-dominating interactions that allow the earth to flourish. How do we get in touch with nature in a different and new way? One idea is proposed by David Abram, uh, the philosopher who wrote The Spell of the Sensuous, and he argues that we can hear nature's voice in a different way. Nature speaks differently to us if we listen, if we smell, if we taste, if we be in nature in a different way than Francis Bacon would have wanted us to. By hearing the rustling of leaves in the oak tree or by listening to the rhythm and lilt of the local soundscape. So nature is fundamentally unpredictable. And what are unpredictable? Hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, um, earthquakes. These are the aspects of nature that make it necessary for us to rethink our relationship to it. And here um, is an example from uh, uh, Yellowstone National Park of simulations of what the land looked like when fire suppression began in 1872 and when um, fires uh, took over and transformed uh, Yellowstone Park in 1972. So how do we work in partnership with nature? 
landscape architects, um, urban planners have devised ways to think about nature and partnership with humans through design. And in this illustration, um, it shows how the river has continually been straightened uh, over time, channelized between 1912, 1925, 1945, and 1965, and then how we can restore the meander in the river and restore the wetlands, which will allow us now, instead of controlling uh, and dominating nature, to become a partner uh, with it. Another example here in um, Oakland and the University of California is the work of Louise Mozingo in um, landscape architecture who has worked with a culturally diverse group of citizens in the Oakland Hills, um, European Americans, African Americans, Asian American, Hispanic Americans working together to devise a new landscape for the area in which they live. And in Los Angeles, another example uh, from California, uh, Achva Stein and Norman Millar um, worked out a plan for using the spaces under freeways uh, for gardens or having um, vegetable gardens on the roofs of uh, parking structures and of using the neighborhood, uh, which is also culturally diverse, to grow um, food and to transform it from uh, concrete structures into a living organic um, revitalized system. So I would like to propose in uh, concluding that we have come a long way from the world of Francis Bacon. We've come a long way from the idea that we need to dominate and control nature in order for humans to survive on the planet. And we are now at the point where we need a new ethic for our survival, and that is an ethic of partnership between humanity and the natural world. Thank you very much. In, in terms of the degradation of nature and the attitude, um, you, you, you got as far as um, science and technology and the mechanistic, but what about sort of the corporate mentality, the whole corporatization of the world, how that's affecting you know, the ecological imbalance? And, and, and that's another human being, as it were, you know, has the status of a person. How do we deal with that? <laughs> Right, well, the egocentric ethic is um, what is good for the individual or the corporation acting as an individual is good for society as a whole. So the egocentric ethic, which I want to move away from, is exemplified uh, potentially in our uh, oil spill off the uh, Gulf. Um, and that is a attempt to make nature into a, con a closed, confined space. Um, and now that it has uh, blown up, the forces of nature have come through to the surface. They are trying to cap it off and close it off with a tube and then a uh, top over it. That is a mechanical system. And that is a mechanical system devised by corporate capitalism, which goes hand in hand with mechanism. Um, we live in a corporate capitalist world that has um, an ethic of mechanism and the egocentric approach to ethics. So I would uh, argue that a partnership ethic can sometimes work with respect to um, corporations. Uh, there are numerous examples where a company wanting to develop um, a new research site on a large piece of land will need to negotiate in partnership with the uh, community 
to create wetlands and open spaces and uh, migratory uh, bird flyways through the place that they are working. Uh, they need to have um, green architecture and recycled uh, water systems and so on. So we don't have to give up corporate capitalism, but we need to be able to work with especially small businesses in a partnership relationship. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. And the first one is linked to the area of the world that I'm honored to work in, which is the Bolivian Andes. And when I go there to work, I work with local uh, Aymara natives who uh, live there, and their worldview about nature, they're farmers, they've been farmers for 4,000 years, so it's not recent. Um, but their view of nature is that it is a relationship that you cannot get rid of. It's like you're born into a family, and you know you can move away, but you always have a you know that's your mother, and and that is your relationship. And so they see it as a partnership, I think, as you're seeing it. But it's much more intimate and almost mutually responsible. The concept of responsibility goes both ways for them. And it seems to me that there may be some indigenous views of working with nature, uh, living. That where the humans aren't so di different or desperate, which I think is what you're saying by moving the table out in the forest and having their voices, that th they just don't see that dichotomy in our, I know this is our Western tradition, but there are other traditions where people have been more sustainable. So it seems to me that might be helpful in a new conversation. And the second thing is that keeps lurking in my mind is these, um, Copenhagen, Tokyo, and recently in Bolivia itself, in Cochabamba, there was a meeting just last week. Um, why are those, are, do you think those are progressing and moving in the right direction? Why do we keep hearing that those are stalling and how can we merge m models that you're proposing with on the ground, not just corporations, but on the ground action? Well, thank you very much for the contribution about um, the Andes and especially indigenous peoples. And I agree completely with you that there are practices and models for us to engage with. And um, all people with ideas such as this coming to the table may help us uh, move toward what you're asking for, which is, to have the people who are doing the negotiations at these meetings take on ideas of partnership in that we come to the table with the expectation that we are going to take a year, two years at the table to try to reach an understanding. We don't go to the meeting and then we go home and uh, th things uh, fall away, but we stay at it until we get to the point of a sustainable relationship. Thank you very much for everything, I appreciate it.